In part one of Moonfaker No Crater Addendum, Jarrah plays the oh so familiar armadillo rocket hanging on a chain video. Jarrah claims that this armadillo rocket can blast a hole in the concrete from the pressure exerted by the exhaust plume. Private company Armadillo Aerospace built a LOX alcohol powered rocket packing only 500 pounds of thrust to the lunar module's 3,000 pounds of thrust. This puny engine blasted a hole through concrete. This contradicted the claim that a 3,000 pound thrust engine is not enough to dig a crater in the lunar surface. First, consider this. How much pressure does an automobile tire place on the ground? Most of you are probably thinking this is a trick question, and you're right to think so. The pressure that an automobile tire exerts on the ground is equal to the pressure of the air inside the tire. Simple, huh? If your tires are inflated to 35 psi, then they exert 35 psi on the ground. If you ever need to calculate the tread contact area of a tire, you simply divide the weight of the automobile by the number of tires to get the weight per tire, and then divide that by the tire pressure. Underinflated tires ride lower and have a larger contact patch, while overinflated tires ride higher and have a smaller contact patch. A 3 inch diameter nozzle will certainly produce a pressure of 70 psi at the source. Now, what will that pressure become on the ground? If the flame continues expanding at the same rate, it will be 10 times its original diameter when it reaches the ground. That makes it 100 times the area, resulting in a pressure of only 0.7 psi. So if Jer is correct and the armadillo rocket can destroy concrete with an exhaust plume of 0.7 psi, then how can an automobile remain parked on concrete indefinitely without any fear of falling through to the center of the earth when each tire presses down on that concrete with 50 times more pressure than the armadillo rocket? Perhaps pressure isn't what causes the concrete to break up. Is it the total thrust? Assuming the air under the rocket has no mass to block the exhaust and all the thrust makes it to the ground, then the armadillo rocket presses on the ground with 500 pounds of force. A small car has more than 600 pounds on each tire, so again, the car would be more likely to cause damage than the rocket engine. So what's tearing up the concrete during this test firing? The original Armadillo MPEG video is 321 by 272 pixels. Not really high res, but if you blow it up about two and a half times and look at the concrete at the beginning of the video, before the rocket is even ignited, you will see visible scorch marks already on the concrete. Here's an 8x blow up of the image if that helps you see the marks any better. These black marks indicate that there have been multiple firings of a rocket in the spot prior to the particular run that Jera finds so fascinating. In other words, the concrete has already been thermally stressed. As the rocket engine fires, the heat from the exhaust literally cooks the concrete. This heat induces uneven expansion of materials in the concrete, causing stress. The heat also causes any water trapped in the concrete to boil and turn to steam, which expands, causing even more stress. After several seconds of exposure to such extreme temperatures, the concrete literally explodes. This process is called thermally induced spalling. The little flecks of concrete that are shooting up straight back in the direction of the engine were launched by the force exerted by the concrete as it buckled and have nothing to do with downward force of the rocket engine. Typically you see spalling in concrete walls that have been exposed to fire. This spalling is caused by the heat of the fire, not by any pressure applied to the wall. So it looks like Jera has made a hasty conclusion and identified the wrong assignable cause. Below the midpoint, the flame's exterior cools to infrared and can no longer be seen. Here, Jerry explains that the exhaust from the armadillo rocket turns invisible to the naked eye because the gas is cool and become infrared. Later, in regard to a photo I used of a rocket engine in high altitude testing, he explains that the gases are fainter around the perimeter due to lower pressure. The next relevant item of evidence is a picture of an engine being tested in a near vacuum. Webb points out that this flame has a spread angle of 85 degrees. He then uses this angle to calculate the pressure on the ground as 0.301 psia. Well, the calculations look good, but there is a big problem with one of the assumptions. Namely, that the 85 degree spread is uniform 
and the flame is evenly expanding into the corresponding area. If we look again at the earlier photo, you'll notice the flame coming out at 85 degrees is only a fine spray of exhaust gas because you can easily see through it. The bulk of the flame heads straight down. The angle of this flame spread is a few degrees at most. So how is it that one rocket has gases that fade due to cooling, while the other rocket has gases that fade due to less pressure? This seems to be selective physics to me. Jera is basically cherry picking, selecting whatever plausible explanation best fits this agenda. Actually, if you combine Jera's reasons, they are basically true for both rocket engines. As the gases shooting out of the nozzle of either engine expand, they get cooler and thinner the farther they get from the nozzle. The gases from both engines get fainter at the perimeter for the same reasons. Also, something else that Jera might not understand is the fact that the high altitude test chamber is not as effective a vacuum as outer space. Once the rocket engine begins dumping exhaust gases into the chamber, there is no vacuum. The exhaust can only be sucked out of the chamber at the same rate as produced by a powerful pump to maintain a low pressure. This evacuation process contributes to the plume appearing denser toward its center. So, the Armadillo rocket can damage concrete with heat, not pressure or force, and the gases from all rocket engines get fainter the farther they get from the nozzle as temperature and pressure approach ambient conditions. I don't see why either of those facts should be difficult to understand, even for a conspiracy theorist. Ciao, Moon Hoax conspirators, wherever you are.